Now, our final guest speaker is uh, Nicholas Boys smith He's director of Create Streets, which is a social enterprise uh, which promotes uh, beautiful, high-density, low-rise urban housing. Uh, and he is also the beneficiary uh, of a government sacking uh, because he is chairman of the government's Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, which used to be chaired by the philosopher Roger Scruton, but uh, he said some remarks which were misreported in a publication, not in the Times. That prompted the Secretary of State to sack him on the spot, uh, and uh, Nicholas became chairman in his place. That's an so. introduction, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm not going to speak about that today. I, um, um, here's, a, here's a quote for you, here's a thought. A couple of decades ago, it was perfectly normal to smoke cigarettes inside. Today, very few would do that. It's the same with cars in the city centre. One day, we will look back and ask ourselves why we ever thought that was a good idea. Now, those words, admittedly in Norwegian, uh, were said by the, uh, your equivalent in, in Oslo, in fact. Um, and I'd like to just frame a few quick thoughts by asking, what would Joseph Bazalgette do? Um, every few years, perhaps every 20 or 30 years, a, a sea change in public attitudes comes along, where some combination of changing social mores, technology, leads to a fundamental change in how we think about something. Go back, you know, 70, 80 years to the invention of the motor car. Well, the, the, not the invention, but it's, it's, it's promulgation into, into, you know, into the 1920s as opposed to the early ones a century ago. You know, the motor car in the 1920s was a thing of freedom. They were rare, they were very expensive. Bertie Worcester had one to tootle along to his, uh, to his, uh, you know, his, uh, his weekend with Aunt Dahlia or whatever. They weren't a thing that clogged up the city. They were marvellous things, actually, in, in, their, in, in their inception. They were a thing of freedom. You know, fast forward 70, 80 years, and they're no longer a thing of freedom. We've, we've made a fundamental mistake, not just us, but you know, across the Western world, across the world, in fact, of thinking that this thing that's quite good at getting around in empty roads in the country is something we should put into essentially a historic street pattern. And that was a fundamental error that has become very, very consequential in, its, uh, in, in, in reality. And we are, I think, at the tipping point where maybe we're not yet quite at a majority. You said, I think, Chris, that you know, everyone agrees on the, uh, on the outcome. I'm, I'm not sure we're quite there, everyone does, but certainly I, I think a growing proportion of it. The school mums, sorry, that's sexist. The school parents test is a good, uh, is a good test. You know, ask any parent, would you like your kids to walk to school? And they'd love to. My, my kids don't walk to school. We don't cycle to school because I don't want to get, you know, I, I love them. I don't want them to get killed. Um, we've got to get to that tipping point, but the, 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 the fruit is there for the plucking. And I think the, the politicians who pluck that fruit and who get a slightly ahead, actually, perhaps, of reality and public attitudes will, will, will reap the benefits. Um, so what would Basil Jett do? I mean, we're doing great work in Manchester, in London. We're not doing great work in many other British cities. And I'd, I'd urge even in London and Manchester, you know, we could do much more. When, when we were faced with, the, you know, the, the stink of the, of the 19th century, we built a 1,000 miles of sewers and fundamentally changed how we thought about sewers from something that was a sort of dry sewer under a Georgian house into, you know, a fully fundamental network of pipes that were citywide. And we need to completely change, in a very profound way, how we think about the city. So the answer to the question, what would Basil Jett do, is he'd do more. Um, three three subsequent, subsequent questions, which, which cities have done more? How have, they, how have they built up to their radicalism in incremental and politically doable steps? And, and why do different people oppose or support it? I, I won't touch on the third, because I think Heidi and, and, and Chris know more about that than I do. But here are six ideas. I won't go into them in detail, because we can, we can explore them in more detail as we perhaps talk. The first, which um, we've touched on, is measure what matters. To improve something, you must track it. One of my colleagues, Letty, in the audience has just been trying to measure what impact the Hammersmith Bridge closure has had on air quality. Well, it seems to still be getting better, um, but you can't really be very precise because <laughs> there isn't a publicly available uh, evidence nearby. So we need to get better at that. We've, we've got a tool called Street Score where we can track com uh, correlations between urban form and social outcomes and indeed value. The one that is least correlated with value of property and social outcomes is air quality because people can't measure it, they're not aware of it in the way they are of some of the others, I think. The second one, and, and you touched on this, Rachel, is to is think of this not just about air quality, though that's very important, but as a fundamental issue of public health and livability. Don't just think about sustainable transport, but think about places. Um, think about gentle density. Think about changing streets in ways that people leave happier lives, know more of their neighbours, are more inclined to walk, not just because it's safer, but actually because it's a more attractive walk. There's a really good research, we've done some of it, there's others by others, that shows that if a place is an attractive place to walk, 
with a more variegated street pattern, with more trees, even when other things are held equal, people are more likely to walk there because it's a nice place to be. You're not you know, confining yourself to the metal box. Um, a, a third thing is uh, you know, to be far, far more ambitious on bikes and not to get confused between bikes as a, uh, in, the, in the bits of the city where you're going from A to B and bikes in the older, more finely grained, denser cities where you're needing to integrate with other transport modes. So you know, bike lanes if you're coming in from Balham to the city, but actually having the confidence to get into some sort of, I'm going to be controversial here, some sort of mellowed shared surface if you're in a more finely grained, a denser uh, urban form. Um, Seville has multiplied its bike trips 11-fold in, in a remarkably short period of time um, you know, by being incredibly ambitious and, and, and bold. So I think there's, there's still a lot more to do on that, and there's still a lot more to do in, in our smaller towns and cities. Um, next point I'd make is to, is, to, is to work with our history. Um, we, because we're in an island, got rid of our city walls much, much earlier than most of Europe. That's actually been quite advantageous now to Europe recently. It's been much easier for them to pedestrianize and continue to use trams because their cities have tended to be much more compact. Uh, we expand, you know, London expanded behind its city walls in the, in, in the 15th century. But the consequence is that London is a city of villages. Two cities, Westminster and London, which joined up with a series of, uh, of, you know, of, of Saxon and medieval villages. If we, and this is moving on to my next point, if we're going to start having car-free days, we can't have a car-free day across all of London. That's not going to work in the immediate future. But you could have car-free days in those nodes where you can actually quite easily get to, um, uh, but you know, by car possibly, um, and you know, we have to work with, uh, you know, with, the, with the urbanism that we've got. So the, the, the fourth one is we have to be much more ambitious about the car uh, and uh, using car-free days, uh, dynamic road pricing, uh, banning cars from city centres and really going out there and taking, uh, taking some risks. I think the population is nearly ready for that. Um, I think there's something, if you look at some of the demographics of how, what people think. So I think there's a lot of scope there to be much more ambitious uh, on uh, you know, starting to use tactical urbanism to take cars out on certain days in certain places. And, and then finally, um, again, just to be a bit provocative, um, to team up with trams. We, we pulled out some, some research, uh, well, some, just some data here on, on French cities that have trams. Avignon has two tram lines with a population of 90,000. That's about the same population as Tewkesbury or Stevenage. Um, trams, I think someone touched on the fact that, you know, the, uh, the pollution from... Uh, doesn't just come from the exhaust, it also comes from the particulates and from the tyres. Trams have, uh, I think it's 10 times less rolling resistance than, than buses do. They're also far more predictable, far more reliable. You get, so are there ways in which we can make trams cheaper to bin? At the moment, regulations say you need to dig up all the utilities underneath to put in a tram line. Do we need to keep doing that? Maybe we just accept that once a year that you, know, you have to stop the tram for a few hours while you, you know, big up utilities. Are there ways to rethink what public transport we get in there. We've got the second smallest amount of light rail per person per capita in Europe, uh, only Greece is worse. Um, so there's a lot to do there, and I'll stop there, but I'll just remind you of that quote from in Norwegian, which I won't say in Norwegian, from the Oslo mayor, cigarettes inside, complete change in, in less than 20 years, and we need to do the same, thank you. <laughs>